Great to, great to see you, great to have you here. I think we'll make this interactive. Uh, Susan asked me to uh, talk about something, uh, and uh, what was on my mind was uh, what's happening at the Lou Ruvo Center. There's a lot of changes going on, and I thought, well, let's talk about, talk about change. And I heard the other day that everybody likes progress as long as it doesn't involve change. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're struggling to make sure that everybody has a consensus about what we're doing and where we're going. Here's our beautiful building. I love to show this. Everywhere I lecture in the world, I show our building, tell people to come and see us. Yes. I thought I'd say something about the history that you might not know. Each slide will begin with, did you know that? <laughs> and we'll, you'll, I'll see how many of you know something. I thought I'd tell you about the firm. That's our current structure, uh, because there may be more or less going on than you know, and I think you don't hear enough about the programs in Cleveland and our growth there, and the programs uh, in Florida and our growth there. So I thought I would just kind of touch on what else is happening with the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health. Program growth, we are recruiting new doctors. Last week and this week we're interviewing Moving day, I think a lot of you have, um, have heard that we're going to open up a floor across the street and we're going to put uh, people across the street uh, and uh, so we'll, we'll be uh, occupying some new space. What's next? Uh, and then just finish with touching on our core values. All right, did you know Lou Ruvo? So we're the Lou Ruvo Center, and Lou Ruvo died of Alzheimer's disease in 1994. Uh, and all of our programs in our center are in memory of Lou Ruvo. So when we say keep memory alive, one of the memories that we're keeping alive is the memory of Lou Ruvo. So he's at the core of, of, uh, of all of this. I kind of like this picture. He looks a little kind of, you know, like he has a chip on his shoulder, uh, ready to go. Uh, did you know that our founder, Larry, of course, honoring his father, and that's Camille, his wife, did you know that uh, he is on the board of Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland and very influential? in the Cleveland Clinic as a whole, throughout the whole organization. So he's our prime mover here, uh, but uh, you might not have appreciated kind of how influential he is throughout the Cleveland Clinic system. He's the only person I know who has Toby Cosgrove on speed dial. <laughs> so he can get to Toby if he needs to, Toby being the CEO of uh, Cleveland Clinic. Did you know that we were born in Spagos? <laughs> How likely is that, that we'd be born in Spagos? <laughs> oh, you were there. Okay, fantastic. Fantastic. Move over here where you can see my pictures. <laughs> so we even have a person who was there. That's fantastic. How were we born in Spagos? Well, Spagos has a room on the second floor at the back. Uh, and in 1996, two years after Mr. Lou Ruvo's death, Larry and friends had gathered, including you, had gathered to celebrate Lou's life. Uh, and they thought, well, we should do something to keep memory alive and to memorialize Lou Rubo. And so that night they decided to form Keep Memory Alive, or at least that was the meeting that, lead, that led to the beginning of Keep Memory Alive, because there was an impulse that evening to do something, to create something uh, new and big. So we were born, and you are all here today, as am I, because of our, our birth in Spagos. 
So next time you walk by Spago's, you'll think, wow, I, we were born there. Is that Caesar's Fantastic. That's Caesar's Palace. Yeah. It's, in, it's in Caesar's, yeah. Uh, yeah, Caesar's, yeah, Caesar's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Exactly. And then um, who were the people? Well, I'm going to show you a couple. You tell us who was there. There were 12 people. My husband and I, Larry and Camille. Um, I believe it was Mark, Mark and Jane Shore. Could have been Steve Wynn. Um, Mike Severino. I'm going to ask my husband. Okay. There, I believe there were 12 or 14. That's a, this is... There were only 28. This is a memory <laughs> test, and you're doing pretty well so far. So... <laughs> Good. I'm going to show you someone that you didn't name. So, of course, just Wolfgang Puck, uh, you all know, is the, the head of Spago's. Uh, but you might not know that he's continued to be very supportive of the Lurubo Center, that his mother died of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and so he feels very connected with trying to find more effective treatments for this disease. And he has a wine called Puck, and we make a little money on each bottle that we sell. So please drink <laughs> Wolfgang Puck wine when you have a bottle of wine. Uh, here is the Wolfgang Puck wine, and right on, here's, see, here, see, here's our logo, Keep Memory Alive, see it right there? And here he says, it's honor of my mother who died of Alzheimer's disease. There are four wines in this series. And the uh, Sauvignon Blanc got a, 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 a wine spectator score of 91. I'm gonna quiz you on this later, so remember that figure, 91. <laughs> well, of course, through Larry, we're very connected with a variety of liquors, all right? <laughs> so here's Jean-Paul de Joria, and he was at this. Yes, he, was. he was at the dinner. And he wrote the first check. So he handed Larry a check for $5,000 and said, we ought to do something to memorialize your dad. And that was the very first check that came in to keep memory alive was from Jean-Paul de Joria. And this, if you know this tequila, if you're a tequila, like sommelier, I don't know what they call tequila sommeliers, tequiliers. Um, I just made that up. Um, uh, it's a wonderful tequila. And you might know that up by, on the third floor, uh, you'll see a statement from Jean-Paul de Joria. It's right out, I see Christine shaking her head. It says, success unshared is failure. Um, so uh, Jean-Paul has continued to support the center, and, and, uh, but he wants us to know his message, which is success unshared is failure. Uh, we're not making anything on the tequila per bottle, so if you could stick with the wine, I think that would, it'll be better for us. <laughs> and probably better for you, as a matter of fact. <laughs> All right. Well, this is Leon Thal. And if you go out and look at our memory board out here on the, just by the entrance, if you look right in the center, the very geometric center, you'll see the name of Leon Thal. So why is Leon Thal so central to the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health? And it's because he was Lou Ruvo's doctor. So he could not, Larry could not find a doctor here who knew about you know, what causes memory impairment, and was there anything to do about it, and what to expect. So he wound up going to this man, who is truly one of the leaders of Alzheimer's disease uh, in the world. He ran the program at UCSD, but he also ran several national level programs as well. So he's a very influential uh, doctor. Larry liked him a lot, as we all did. He was a personal friend of mine. Uh, and uh, Larry had raised at one point about $35 million. And he said to Leon, well, let's build a building at UCSD and put my dad's name on it. And, you know, this will be my memory of Lou. And Leon 
unlike every other academic I know, said, well, you know, you came here because you couldn't find what you needed in Las Vegas. And the people of Las Vegas need a facility. Um, so, so that's a, an extremely generous spirit that would have a response like that. And so at that point, then, Leon became Larry's chief consultant in terms of what they were going to do here. First, it was going to be a nursing home. Then it was going to be a, a program by a lower level architect. And eventually, of course, it was escalated up to uh, Frank Geary. So Leon uh, was such a, a, a man and was very adventurous and included in, in his many interests was flying his own plane. And so he was killed in a plane crash where he was flying alone uh, from UCSD out to the desert to see his wife. So we lost Leon, otherwise he would be uh, extremely influential in the, the practice today. And here's the other man I thought I would call attention to. This is Zavin Kachaturian. Some of you might have met Zavin if you've been here long enough. He was the scientific director of this program before Cleveland Clinic took it over. And I want to call attention to him because he also was extremely influential in the world of Alzheimer's disease research. In fact, he was the head of the federal programs of all Alzheimer's disease funding and centers for the United States in the National Institutes of Health. So he led that whole program, he, he went to Congress, he fought for the money for, to create Alzheimer's centers around the country. He really was the architect of the major uh, research programs in the United States for Alzheimer's disease. And he was a great friend of Leon's, uh, and so he, um, uh, when Leon was, of course, very busy and didn't intend to come here right away, and Zavin was available from the NIH, he had just stepped down from the NIH, so, so uh, Leon asked him to come and head the scientific programs here, which he did until uh, Cleveland Clinic uh, took, over the, uh, took over the center. So I tell you this because between uh, Leon and, and Zavin, uh, the, the, the center has an extremely illustrious past uh, in terms of the level of influence of people who are involved in, in building the scientific programs. Zavin, by the way, still has his home here in Las Vegas, and, um, or a, I should say a house here in Las Vegas. He lives in Virginia, but he has a house here, comes out periodically, and I consult with him periodically. Then Larry needed uh, an architect. Uh, and I think you know the story that he tells, but in case you don't, and this is another, did you know that? Uh, Larry decided that he wanted to package this idea of keep memory alive. That if you're going to sell an idea, you have to have great packaging, right? And you are all influenced. We are all influenced by packaging, right? We go into the grocery store and this package looks very cool and we wind up buying it even though the, so we pay a little more for it and the contents are the same as something that has the generic uh, white and blue label. So he said, well, uh, who could I get to package my idea? Well, of course, if you're gonna package an idea this big, you need one of the world's most provocative architects. Uh, and this is Bilbao in, uh, the, this is the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. It's, uh, it's Geary's most famous building. Uh, and uh, so uh, knowing Geary's reputation, uh, Larry, uh, who's a man of large dreams, decided, yes, that, that should be the man to package his idea. So this beautiful center is a package that's what it's about. It's a package for the idea. Who's this? Oscar. All right, Oscar Goodman. So did you know that? Uh, in order to convince Mr. Geary here to do this uh, piece of architecture, Larry and Oscar flew to the studios in Los Angeles, the Geary Studios in Los Angeles. And they were greeted by Geary, who said, I will never build in Las Vegas. And 
Larry said, your secretary said I have 45 minutes and I expect my 45 minutes. <laughs> so it was the Clash of Titans uh, and uh, Larry usually wins as he did this time. Uh, and uh, three hours later they emerged and Gary said, well give me two weeks to think about it uh, and, uh, and, I will, uh, and I'll let you know. And of course that, after that it's history. Um, and you will here, if you read Oscar Goodman's new biography uh, called On Being Oscar, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll read this story about their going to, uh, the, to the Geary studio. So it's a fun uh, episode in that. And this, of course, is one of the, one of the models uh, with uh, Geary looking at it. Which one's Frank Gehry? He's the one right here looking yeah. directly straight yeah. on. Yeah. I actually, who do, who's, is, who's this? Do you know? I don't know who this yeah. is. Yeah. Um, do you know that there are three Frank Gehry buildings in Las Vegas? Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. Because um, during one of the galas, while this building was being built, and you know that there's a live auction at the gala, right? So people bid a lot of money to do something that they really want, and they do it live so it's in front of their friends, so their friends all know that they've spent this money, right? So Gehry agreed as part of the live auction to build a doghouse for the highest bidder. <laughs> so the bidding got extremely high, very high, and Larry, genius that he is, jumped up when it got down to two very high bids and said, well, Frank will build two doghouses and we'll take both bids. Uh, and that happened. Uh, so there are two Frank Geary doghouses in Las Vegas and our building. So there are three there are three Frank Gehry buildings in, the, in Las Vegas. Not many cities can brag of that, and not many know the story of the other two. Uh, did you know that it was called the Lou Ruvo Brain Institute? This was before Cleveland Clinic got into the picture. So you might know that at this point, the building was to be part of UNR. Uh, and UNR was the principal partner. Uh, and then they changed their mind at about this stage of development. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, so then Larry uh, was faced with finding a clinical partner that would run the building and run the program. Uh, and he went on the equivalent of speed dating uh, to find a partner. That's where he and I met. He came to UCLA to see whether I would include it in the Alzheimer program at UCLA. Um, but of course, it would have taken us about two years to get it on the University of California president's uh, desk. Uh, and that's not Larry's speed. Um, and uh, so um, he did find a partner very much aligned uh, with his own goals, which of course was Cleveland Clinic. But at one point, it was the Luruvo Brain Institute and you'll still hear that name occasionally, uh, the Institute, and that it, it seems to have, uh, have stuck. Here's the inside of the building when it's first being constructed. Of course, there's a complicated outside, and therefore there must be a complicated inside. And both of those had to be within a very small tolerance of each other in order for the inside and the outside to match. So here's our beautiful building now. Did you know that it's currently the centerpiece uh, in the Pompidou Center in Paris? Uh, because there is a retrospective of Frank Gehry's work at the Pompidou Center in Paris right now. It's being done in conjunction with his opening of the new Louis Vuitton Center there for which he was the architect. And it's, if you've seen any pictures of the new Louis Vuitton Center, it is extraordinary, just beautiful. Uh, so they, in, the, in the context of opening that new building, then the Pompidou Center uh, did a retrospective of his work. And you see that this is actually the front of the catalog. So they've chosen the interior of our building for the front of the catalog. And then they've used that same piece all over Paris where they are advertising the retrospective. So our building is all over Paris uh, on, these, uh, on these billboards. So how great is that, right? I mean, I think that's, 
fantastic that they chose this. And people who know Frank Gehry's work and have followed it uh, say that this is his greatest interior. Uh, so this, the one that's here, yes. Um, that uh, I, I think because the interior here could be the expression of his imagination. In the, um, in the center in Bilbao, for example, it had to be a museum inside, right? So that has certain constraints. At the music center in, in Los Angeles, it has to be a music center inside. So that has its own constraints. Here, it was a palette on which he could paint his own ideas. Uh, and I think for that reason, it has a kind of integrity uh, which many of the other buildings don't have internally compared to the uh, external surface. So I think it's kind of cool that we're being shown all over Paris. Here's one of the street signs for the Frank Gehry retrospective. But it doesn't say that this is the Las Vegas, you know. Uh, it does inside. Uh, in, does, the oh, in, in the, the in the catalog, in the catalog, oh, in the there's there's a, there are more pictures of the building and explains what we do and all, and all of that. Yeah, you're right. You you can't actually see that this is the 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 Lou Ruvo Center on on uh, on this piece. But when you go to the exhibit, then you will learn. Then you learn that. Yeah. As mentioned, then. Larry needed a clinical partner, and Cleveland Clinic uh, was the partner most well aligned with his own commitment to patients first, to having extensive caregiver programs, and to having research. So this is the 13 square blocks of medical expertise that comprise Cleveland Clinic. So if you've never been there, this is like going to a medical city. It's unbelievable. And let me just see, um, I'm kind of embarrassed to say that the Neurological Institute is kind of tucked in down there in one of the oldest parts of the whole campus. Uh, and we've just learned uh, that a new cancer center is being built uh, in, uh, on the campus, beautiful, camp a beautiful new cancer center. The existing cancer center, also a great building called the Tausig Building, will become the new home of the Neurological Institute. So within a few years then, we'll be moving out of this really ancient part of, of uh, Cleveland Clinic um, and into the beautiful Tausig Building yeah, on, on the campus. You know, I don't know which one is the Tausig Building because I've been there several times, but I can't remember which one was the Tausig. Um, I do, but I do know that it's, uh, or was told that it was an extremely nice, uh, nice building. And then the Mellon Center uh, is kind of over here, and that's where the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health is on the main campus, is over in something called the Mellon Center, which also has multiple sclerosis. So we're kind of displaced off from this uh, main part of the, of the campus where the Lou Ruvo Center is. Uh, here's our CEO, Toby Cosgrove, I think an amazing leader. You, his name was in the paper a lot recently when he was courted to become the head of the Veterans Administration. Remember about, uh, what, about four months ago, I guess, when the, maybe longer, when the VA came under some bad publicity for long uh, waiting times and they asked their former leader to uh, find another position. Uh, and uh, so they were seeking someone to lead the VA, and they, they were courting Toby, but he, had, uh, he decided against it. So this is a piece that I really like. This came out immediately after one of our galas. Uh, and it's a story all about us, and it's called Brain Research as Only Vegas Can. Uh, and I like that idea. Um, I was with a group of scientists over the weekend. They were here, uh, and we had, a, we had a meeting of, of a group called Faster Cures that I'm really excited about. And uh, I went through the history of the center, and they said, you know, this is a radical idea. And I really like that idea, you know, that this is, that we're a radical position, that we're looking for radical solutions, that we want radical technologies that that's the way we should think about things. Uh, so I appreciated his insight. 
And that's what it means to me to say brain research as only Vegas can. And I, I really like the idea that this science appears in the fashion and style section of the, of the, of the, uh, of the New York Times. Uh, so uh, it just shows how many areas of humanity that we touch that we would be in the fashion and style section. Did you know that uh, we had the Surgeon General of the United States here, Regina Benjamin? Uh, one of our great interests in this program is how does repetitive head injury lead in a few cases to a chronic neurological disease? Because we know that football players and boxers are going on to develop Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS at a higher frequency than the general population. So why is that happening? And what makes one athlete vulnerable and not another? And also, of course, one soldier vulnerable and not another. So uh, Charlie Burnick has been leading this program. This is one of the brains, by the way, in which um, this process has occurred. And all this very dark staining here is an abnormal protein that is accumulating in the brain uh, of the injured person. And we're trying to understand that exact protein and why some people get that protein and others don't. And once it starts, then it, then it spreads throughout the brain. So we're trying to understand that. And we had, we had the, actually the very first international conference uh, on chronic traumatic encephalopathy here, and we had the Surgeon General of the United States, uh, uh, Regina Benjamin, come to be part of that program. So again, you know, it's not very many people who can say, we had the Surgeon General of the United States in this building. So it's a great, uh, it's a great uh, testament to our ability to attract the very highest level and most influential people. You need influential people to move a program ahead. Of course, we've had very many influential people here. Here was our visit with, uh, with President Clinton, uh, who articulated our mission very well. Um, I, I love the way he transitioned from the building. He said, it's enormously visually compelling, but what matters is what's going on in this building. And I just thought that was a wonderful statement uh, about, uh, about our programs. Colin Powell has been here. So, you know, he was also an extremely articulate spokesman for the program, and he has sent patients here. Uh, so that's a great, uh, a, a great statement about his confidence in us. And of course, Harry Reid has been a very great supporter of the center as well, as proud of it as a Nevadan. This is before his accident, too. Where he is, uh, where he's got a black eye. I don't know if any of you saw him on television, but uh, uh, that's not a good idea. But we still believe in exercise, even though you know there are <laughs> exercise-related accidents that you have to be careful of. Did you know that uh, Larry King broadcast from our building? So the very first Larry King special after he stopped Larry King Live, was broadcast from our building. And I did his mental status examination in my office, and we did his MRI downstairs because he wanted to show exactly what a patient would go through if they were coming for a memory assessment. So it was a great educational, uh, educational event and very cool to have him here and he attracted a lot of celebrities here at the same time and he liked the center so much he came back the next week with his wife to show it to her and uh, he really has been connected with us many people have asked well jeff did he pass yeah. but i'm sworn to secrecy of course on this point other people that are great allies um, uh, of course, Robin Leach, whose voice you would recognize under any circumstances, uh, is a great supporter and lends his voice to us. And you might not know that on many occasions when he gets an honorarium for doing something, he just sends it along to us. 
So he's been a very great supporter, and he was the principal, principal supporter of our chronic traumatic encephalopathy conference where the Surgeon General came. So you have to have money to make those things happen. Uh, and uh, Robin has been very supportive of that. Here's the, all of the Nobu chefs, George Clooney. Kate makes me show this picture every time I get a chance, you know, with her standing next to George Clooney. Uh, and here's Steven Spielberg uh, in his uh, visit to the, to the center. I just show you these because we've been able to, t to touch many people who are influential and who then talk about us. That's what we want. We want them talking about the problem of Alzheimer's, the problem of Parkinson's, the problem of multiple sclerosis. Uh, how are these going to be approached? How are clinical trials uh, advanced? All right. So that's as much as I have for did you know that? Mm -hmm. Did you learn something new? Yes. Yeah, great. I could learn a lot new too. All right, well, I thought I'd show you the firm. Uh, so just to remind you that there are four Lou Ruvo Centers for Brain Health in the United States, and they're all called the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health. And everywhere that Cleveland Clinic delivers Alzheimer care, it's called the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health. Uh, so we have in Cleveland, uh, and starting in January of this last year, so now just here for a year, I, my director there is Jim Leverance, a wonderful scientist and clinician in all, who has expertise in both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. At the Lakewood campus, uh, which is in, uh, also in Cleveland, um, we have uh, a, a program, a Lou Ruvo Center, devoted, uh, directed by a geriatrician, Bob Tusi. Uh, really terrific guy, really enjoy working with Bobek. The Lakewood Hospital is being closed. A new family center is being built there, and we're going to be part of the new family center. So we were one of the programs that was chosen to be preserved in this um, in a fairly uh, drastic change that's going on in Lakewood. I discovered, by the way, that I had to have two centers because people in Cleveland don't like to cross the Cuyahoga, right? So if you're living on the east side, you don't go over to the west side, the west side, kind of off limits. If you're living on the west side, you don't go over east to, you know, over to the east side. So, and the Cuyahoga uh, uh, divides uh, east from west. So these are my two sides of the Cuyahoga, uh, Lakewood and, and uh, Cleveland. I think we might expand there you know, Cleveland Clinic has 11 hospitals uh, in northern Ohio. It has about, about another dozen family centers, largely large family medicine centers. And I think it would behoove us to actually get a couple of more Lou Ruvo centers for brain health in, in Ohio. So we intend expansion there. Our Florida program uh, is uh, in uh, Weston, Florida, near Fort Lauderdale. Uh, it's, a, it's a large program, and on the 19th of this month, so just, uh, what, two weeks away, almost exactly two weeks away, the new Neurological Institute is opening on the, on the Weston campus, and we're really excited about that. It, the building is larger than the former hospital. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge building, and it's going to have cancer and neurology in it, so those two things together. Uh, and we're, that's where the Lou Ruvo Center is going. I'm really excited about the expanded uh, opportunities there, and we're going to be recruiting more to the, to the Weston site. And then, of course, we have the Nevada site. So I direct all of these and try to keep them all headed the direct, same direction. Sometimes we do clinical trials across all four sites. Sometimes we just choose one site. So it gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of the size of the organization that we want to bring to bear on some program. We're also under one research administration. So you all know that we have to get an approval to do any research. And if you're in four hospitals, you usually have to get four approvals. But because of our organization, we just get one approval and it works for all four hospitals. So that's a great efficiency in terms of, of being able to do research. So at the Cleveland site, we have a couple of, of uh, sub uh, sections. 
One is the Shea, the Shea Center, which is for brain imaging. So we have a special brain imaging center as part of the Center for Brain Health. And we also have a brand new, and this is Dr. Leverance's passion, biorepository, which means that we're collecting blood from people every, uh, that come, are coming in from the Center for Brain Health. We'll do that from here as well. We haven't started yet, but we will. Uh, we will uh, do genetic testing on them. Uh, we'll have that material available if somebody discovers that there's a protein that might be a, a huge hint to Alzheimer's disease, then we'll also already have those blood samples ready to go. So it's very, very forward looking to have a biorepository and Jim and his wife, who's also a, a biologist, are, are building the biorepository for us in Cleveland. I'm really excited about that. And then of course here, we've got a lot going on. Just to remind you, we have the MS program under Lehua. We have the PD program with Ryan. We have the Alzheimer and Frontotemporal Dementia program under Dr. Burnick and Dr. Legere. We have neuropsychology with Dr. Banks. Brain imaging now with Dr. Cordes. The clinical trials and the brain health registry with Dr. Zong our education program with Dr. Wint, and the professional fighters brain health study with Dr. Burdick. So it's a lot going on, right? It's a lot of, it's a lot of boxes here. Uh, and all of those boxes have people in them and programs and active uh, scientific research. So it's, um, it is comparable to any university in which you might find your, yourself. And it's, uh, it's uh, I'm proud of, this particular group of things, and eventually I'm gonna to have to use smaller font or two slides, one of the two, but uh, we're, we're doing fine. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about program growth. Feel free to ask any questions as we're going along. Uh, so definite and in process are Parkinson's disease. We found a guy that we really like He's interviewing in Cleveland. If they uh, like him there, then we'll hire him. So we have one person in Parkinson's disease now, but one is not enough. Uh, and we have waiting lists, and we don't want people to wait. We want people to be able to get in in a reasonable period of time. Uh, so Parkinson's disease is expanding, as is multiple sclerosis. So we're seeing a candidate tomorrow for the multiple sclerosis program. If we like her and if she, if she likes us after she comes out, uh, then uh, we'll offer her a position as well. And if not, then we'll go on to someone else. But we do have a good candidate coming tomorrow. So the, both of those programs are, are, are growing. And we only, again, we only have one multiple sclerosis doctor and we need another. Neuropsychology, uh, Dr. Banks is looking at several candidates. We have really great candidates who have applied for our position. We have two full-time neuropsychologists now. We'll hire a third, and I expect that we'll hire a fourth before very long. But we'll we'll see what uh, how the thir adding the third one adjusts our capacity. Excuse me. Are you yeah. talking about the entire Blue Rubo? No, program? this is all here. I'm sorry. This oh, is all here. Awesome. This is all here. I think I might have a little bit about the other programs here, but this is all yeah, right, right here. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll try to remember to tell you the difference. But all of this applies to Nevada and Las Vegas. Um, brain imaging, Dr. Cordes is building a fantastic program. So he already has two master's levels mathematicians with him now, and we intend to hire four more. So we will have four, uh, we'll have six altogether technicians driving the brain imaging program. And what a mathematician, and Dr. Cordes is a medical physicist, what he's able to do is to change MRI from a diagnostic instrument to a discovery instrument. So rather than just looking and say, oh, there's a white patch and it must be a stroke, um, he can actually look at the formulae that are used to generate those images and get more information out of the impact of the magnetic resonance. And we have, uh, we have some of our imaging folks here today. Actually, I guess we have just Pat, do we have Laura? Oh, we have Laura here, okay, great. So Laura, is, Laura runs our imaging, um, imaging program and uh, Dittmar is able to take the, the, the information directly from the magnet 
which is mathematically understood in order to generate the images and to generate brand new information out of that. So we're excited about DITMAR and the expansion of the brain imaging program. Can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. You can ask a slow question if you want. Well, I don't know if I can. <laughs> This has probably nothing to do with what you're talking about, but I'm just thinking about under the brain imaging. What's the difference between the MRIs and like gamma knife and that type of thing? Mm -hmm. MRI is a way of imaging the brain, and gamma knife actually uh, uses, I think it's laser, I think it's a laser, I don't know if you guys know or not, I think it's a laser to actually excise like a brain tumor. Um, and or in movement disorders to make a little hole so that you can stop the tremor that's occurring in some patients. So it's interventional, and our MRI is only, um, it's a way of characterizing the brain, not a way of, inter of intervening. So in consideration is someone who would come to the Alzheimer program and also add to our clinical trials staff, and I just got approval yesterday to do this. Um, so I didn't have time to change my slide, but I just got approval yesterday. So we will definitely start the hiring process to, for someone who would be working with Dr. Zong to expand the clinical trials program. We're doing so many trials and have expanded so fast in terms of the trials program that we just can't do it with one person anymore. And we need to bring in more strength. And it's a really, it's a great program. I am very happy with the clinical trials program. In the infusion study, so that's uh, run by Lily. Dr. Burnham. Pardon? Dr. Burnham. Yes, right. Um, we are, so uh, we're doing that only at one other site in the Cleveland Clinic system, but there are probably are a hundred sites worldwide. Um, so we're, we're, uh, uh, we're part of a worldwide uh, enterprise. I better hurry up. So moving day, all right? Just thought I'd show you what we're doing so that you'll know what's happening here. Here's the world market across the street. We've decided that we could occupy it. Um, so we're gonna move the administrative team to the world market on the second floor. And there'll be, there's a lot more space there. Uh, and um, so I hate to have people going out of our beautiful building, and I hope that they do not feel like exiles. Uh, but uh, we, just have to, we just have to create more space in the building to do more, and therefore the people who aren't directly involved with the care of patients uh, can reasonably reside in a nearby facility. Is that where the clinical trials will be? Nope. Or will you sign no. up for it? Or um, um, the, everything is going to stay right here with regard to anything that has to do with patients. So it will still be right here. Every, nothing will change with regard to that. But, uh, you know, our marketing folks uh, uh, like uh, Nicole or, or, you know, our budgetary people, they don't need to be sitting next to the space where we're seeing patients. And so uh, we will welcome you back. When you, <laughs> when you want a, a stroll across the street, uh, but uh, we will be moving the administrative team there. Now that will create the opportunity to move the research team to the fourth floor. So we're gonna have more space uh, and we're gonna have more technology. Uh, and right now the third floor is pretty cluttered looking if you've been up there, and we're gonna be able to open up that third floor where we have crammed all of the researchers and the research team into one small area. I'm very excited about this. The trials technology is really growing, and I wanna be able to show people that more uh, in a really exciting way. That will allow me then, if I move the research team to the fourth floor, I can now move by new, all my new doctors to the third floor, because we're at currently out of offices on the third floor. But if I move the research team up, now I have my, my Parkinson's, my multiple sclerosis, my new Alzheimer's, all of them can be on the, on the, on the third floor. So you can see that this is a giant domino game that we're playing here. 
And of great importance to our volunteers is the library, currently on the fourth floor. So the library will come to the first floor as part of all of this. So you know that when you come in and you check in, there's, a, there's a one large room, and then there's a partial barrier, and then there's a second large inner room there. So that second large inner room is going to be the library. Uh, and I think it'll be just great because people will be able to march right in there when they're waiting for imaging or something, they'll be able to read the latest. Uh, and I think it'll be a, a, a way of integrating our library into our, our family, family interactions in a, in, a, in a much better way. Also on the first floor, back in the imaging area where Elaine and Laura are, there is an empty room. Uh, and we're going to take that room and create three testing rooms for neuropsychology. Because I've told you that we're expanding neuropsychology, so where are we gonna, where are we gonna do the testing? We're gonna do it on the first floor. So uh, we'll have the, and in the, the room where we had the chair, for those of you who are on the inside know about the chair, which was a way of stimulating the brain, we've taken the chair out, um, and uh, we'll put the neuropsychology technicians in the chair room. So we'll be able to accommodate all of this. We will, by the way, try to do all of these moves and everything uh, on the weekends. So hopefully you'll just go out on Friday and you'll come back on Monday and it'll all be done. Uh, because we want as little disruption of patient care, as little noise, of course, Elaine, Elaine can't do a scan if there's noise going on. And um, so, we, so we have to arrange all of this uh, ahead of time. Any questions about the, about the move? Pretty complicated and it's all gonna occur over about the next two months. Uh, there's already work going on in the world market. So it's gonna, it's, uh, it won't be long. Uh, what's next? Uh, just a few things, of course, new staff and new space. You've heard all about that. Some of the new trials we're doing, I'm really excited about. There's a drug called resagiline that's been used very extensively in Parkinson's disease, and there are many reasons to believe that it should be even more powerful in Alzheimer's disease. And so we uh, received a million dollars from the Alzheimer Drug Discovery Foundation to pursue a study of this drug that we're just really delighted with. We're also studying Inhibiting disinhibition. So one of the things that occasionally happens to patients with brain disease, particularly if, if it affects the front part of the brain, is they become disinhibited. So the front part of the brain is what makes you a sociable creature. For example, we have a certain interpersonal space that we feel comfortable with, but if you have a frontal lobe disorder, sometimes you just stand too close to people <laughs> and you make them uncomfortable <laughs> by standing too close. Or you might say something, you know, you might say something that all of us think, but we know enough not to say it, right? But the patient with the frontal lobe disorder, he or she goes ahead and says it. So that's a problem. And there's a very interesting drug that we believe might control this problem, which is extremely embarrassing to families and very disabling to patients. Um, so we're looking at that and we have um, some uh, very exciting uh, opportunities there. We're also gonna do a new kind of brain imaging that I'm really excited about. You know that for a little more than a year, we built, Elaine's machine has been able to look at plaques to see if the person has the plaque of Alzheimer's disease in the brain. Uh, and here's that scan. And all these red areas are areas that are lit up because they have plaque. Until we had this scan, we couldn't tell if somebody had plaque in the brain until autopsy. What about MS? Is, that, is it the same so, for MS? For very different, very different. They use the same name, so that's a good point. Yeah. But the plaque of MS is different than the plaque of, of Alzheimer's. So now we can see these plaques. 
But you know, there are two major pathologies of Alzheimer's disease. There's the plaque and there's the tangle. So here are the tangles in the brain cells. And we, we, this was always invisible to us until now. And now we have this cool new scan which shows us where the tangles are in the brain. So notice this structure where the arrow is. There's none of the plaque in that brain area, but look how it's affected by the tangle. And the tangle is much more highly correlated with, with the memory problem. So we think the tangle is more critical and therefore this scan more informative than anything else. Yes? Does this involve the new mathematics using the MRI? No, this actually is the PET scan. So Laura is the one who does the MRIs and that's where the mathematics is coming in. And Elaine is the one who does the PET scan and that's where these new kind of, so this is called molecular imaging. So we can actually tell the molecules with, with, uh, with this kind of imaging. And I believe this to be only the beginning. We're going to be able to label all sorts of things that are going to be so helpful in terms of developing new drugs. Yes? Is insurance going to cover PET scans? Well, um, probably not. Uh, this is, these are very expensive to do, and they, we get research funding to do them, uh, but we cannot convince Medicare to, to pay them, pay for them, and until Medicare does, no insurance company will. So we're, we're in a battle with them right now, uh, and uh, we're really arguing for the importance of this scan in particular. This scan is still too new for us to have a powerful argument. This scan, we have learned so much about our patients with this scan. It's unbelievable. And, and yet, Medicare, of course, is afraid to approve something that would, uh, in, uh, you know, give them more costs. So, but, you know, I don't know. What's a patient to do? I mean, it's going to cost them how much? Uh, Six thousand dollars. For a test. For, for, for this test. scan. For this scan. And the, the this scan you can only get in research. So this is always free. Oh. This is always free. But you have to be registered in a research a research study in which we're using the scan in order to get it. The same is true of this one. If you're in a research study where we're using the scan, then it's free, of course. But if you just came to me and said, Jeff, I want to know whether I have plaques in the brain, then it would cost uh, $6,000 to get that answer. Do you have any studies that are going on for you? Sorry? Do you have to have Alzheimer's to have that? It's a, it's, a, it's a very, very good question and very, uh, uh, very tricky because this scan actually becomes positive and these plaques appear in the brain at least a decade before the person becomes forgetful. So, uh, so there is a strong predictive value of this, but if you were going to get the disease at, say, 75, it would only become positive by, say, 65, 60 or 65. So, uh, and if someone had a positive scan, we wouldn't know whether they're one, you know, one decade from getting the first symptoms or one minute from getting the first symptoms. So, um, so it's all, you know, it's all embedded in a complex neuroscience. So do you have a research program for that now? We do. We're using it in a lot of scans. We scan. But every week we must be doing these scans in the research program. Yes. Yes. How do you have data to say that it's at least ten years? The um, there are these. Uh, there have been uh, two kinds of studies that show that. One are uh, studies uh, of people at risk because they have a gene. Well, I guess I, actually, I guess all of them are studies of people at risk who have been followed for years, and this scan was available on. The, on a research basis for about a decade now. So we have about a decade's worth of, of scans. And we also have families where we know exactly who's going to get the disease and exactly when because they have a mutation that causes the disease. So everybody who has the mutation gets the disease. And it's true in families. So if the family gets it at age 55, then this person with the mutation is going to get it at 55. And we've done a lot of scanning on those families, and we can see how long before they're getting, going to get symptomatic, their scans are positive. So there's a couple of ways that we've had insight into that. We're still really learning what the sequence of scan positivity is as someone becomes closer and closer to the onset of symptoms. 
Yes. Yes, yes. Everybody has, uh, everybody with Alzheimer's has plaques and tangles, different portions in different patients. Um, and one of the things that this may help us decide is maybe some people should have a plaque drug and maybe some people should have a tangle drug. Uh, and that's, you know, right now we don't, we don't know that until we've sorted it out. Okay, so just I'll touch on core values and we'll stop. So what do we do with our core values? Well, we, we have patients first. Uh, we have caregiver care, uh, and we know that no disease is adequately treated. No brain disease is adequately treated right now. Uh, and so we do clinical trials to find the answers for the next generation of patients to come. And our goal is to store the universe that we all carry between our ears. Uh, that everything we know and all culture and all identity and all memory is bound in the brain and our goal is to make a brain span that matches our lifespan. So I'll stop there and take any questions that you didn't shout out while we were going through. Yes? Quick question. River has it. The design of the building is supposed to represent the confusion of the brain. Is that true or not? Uh, so we had the chance to ask Frank Geary that. And what he says is no. He said, consciously, I was not trying to model anything. I was doing what I want to do as an architect. But he's a great believer in the subconscious. And his best friend was actually a, psycho a, a psychoanalyst, uh, Milton Wexler. Uh, and he said, maybe subconsciously, I was trying to model the brain. Uh, so uh, he even allowed a little wi opening uh, window there. But, he's, but he does say straightforwardly that it was not his attempt to make a brain. Uh, it, his attempt was to use his architectural knowledge to create a great structure. Did you know that? That's another did you know that. <laughs> yes. Are there children with plaques? Are there children with plaques? The youngest case uh, of Alzheimer's I've seen, it was 35, 35 years old. Um, all children with Down syndrome get Alzheimer's disease. All. Isn't that amazing? But they don't get it until they're about 45 or 50. So, um, so they, they have the genetics that drives it. But they, um, but they don't actually get the plaques as children. They have the gene changes, of course, as children. I can't quite think of a disorder in which plaques occur in children. Other questions? Yes? There seems to be several ways that the diagnostic uh, evaluation could be done with the eyes on, on the retina and also the scanning, how the eye scans. Yeah, so there's a lot of work on, the question was what about uh, using the eyes as a diagnostic, because there's a lot of uh, this in the press right now. Eye scanning abnormalities in early Alzheimer's disease and retinal abnormalities. I would say that none of it is mature science yet. It's interesting, and um, I've had one call from the eye tracking person, excuse me, and um, we, we may bring that eye tracking device in here. Uh, so we're, we're talking with them. Um, so I, I think it's just premature to say for sure yet whether or not that's going to work. It would be great if we had something less than $6,000 scan in order, to, uh, in order to get information about early diagnosis. So in general, we're excited about the idea of cheaper mechanisms for detecting early disease. But I would say we're not confident in those yet. Well, getting, back to that, getting back to that scan, um, how many of these scans do you do in the brain to make the diagnosis? Uh, in, it's magnified so much. Yes. In general, we just, uh, <laughs> how many different kinds of scans do we do? Areas. Oh, how many different areas? areas. Like, we're only looking at a very small right, space. Right, right, right. We do, what's the, what's the number of, of um, slices in our average scan, Laura? Uh, yeah. Well, let's, let's take MRI first because that has the largest number. How many slices are there in the... In the, in the, it in varies per protocol, it's like a recipe, there's multiple ingredients, but when we're finished, we do 2020 images that are analyzed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. So you see it's a large number for 
for the, uh, the, the mathematical reconstruction of, of, of that. that we were to see these in each plane, we could, or yeah, it would be a huge number. It would be, it'd be a huge number, yes. Yes, we're really excited about the connections uh, because there are many connections. Uh, for example, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Lou Gehrig's, or ALS, for example, all have to do with the accumulation of a protein in the nerve cell. It's a different protein in each disease. But there might be ways of intervening in proteins that would apply across all three diseases which would be so fantastic that we would have a breakthrough that would be informative across multiple neurological diseases, terrible neurological diseases. So we're, we're uh, looking at that and we've had several drugs that have been in more than one kind of neurological disease. And there's a lot of inflammation in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. And one of the things we're thinking about is taking one of the multiple sclerosis drugs, which specializes in suppressing inflammation, and putting it in Alzheimer's disease. And of course, the Lou Ruvo Center is a place to do that because we have multiple sclerosis experts working side by side with our Alzheimer's disease experts. So it's one of the reasons that I find this an exciting environment is because we can work across and talk across disease states in a very easy, barrierless way. Yes. Is it very common for people who, to have uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's at the same time? Yeah, there's a, there's a sort of a crossover disease called Lewy body disease. Uh, and Lewy body. Um, Lewy is L-E-W-Y. Oh, yeah. uh, and people in, with this condition start off with, a, with cognitive changes that look something like Alzheimer's and then rapidly evolve into a Parkinsonian state. Uh, and uh, we have quite a few of those patients here. It's not so uncommon for that to happen. Uh, and, uh, and, when you, and when we look at those brains, much you know, at the end of the illness, they have both the protein of Parkinson's and the protein of Alzheimer's in the brain. So there are, there are these people who are essentially getting both diseases at the same time. Yes? Um, on your bio repository, yeah. uh, could you just go into that just a little more in detail? What, uh, for instance, say you're healthy now, but you have the genetics. Uh, how would that, having that um, done help you? So uh, we, we always need clinical information with the biological information, because if we just have a blood sample, we don't know what that blood sample means, right? So, so in order to make a donation, like a blood sample, to the, to the biorepository, there will be an extensive examination like neuropsychological testing and taking your family history and uh, doing a neurological examination. Then we'll have all of that clinical information. And then let's say that, I don't know, Rudy Tanzi in Harvard Medical School dis discovers a new gene uh, for, for Alzheimer's disease. And we now want to go back and see whether you have that gene. And so we would do that, and then we would also match that with your clinical data. So by creating the biorepository, you're really creating a future in which you can look at a large number of samples uh, at the slightest provocation. Uh, and that's what you want. You want to be all poised to exploit that new discovery. Because as a matter of fact, many new discoveries are wrong. Uh, and subject to non-confirmation. So somebody start, studies a small sample of people, concludes that gene X is really important, and then when you study it in five times as many people, you realize that it was just a biased sample and that gene X is not important. So that's why confirmation has become so important to us because there have been so many false positives in terms of reports. But these biorepositories are allowing us to address that problem very coherently. So when will that be here? Uh, so we will send those, those samples to Cleveland. Cleveland. Um, so we'll collect them here, we'll have the program here, and then all of the, all of the Cleveland clinics will send it to one biorepository. Because you, it's, for one thing, it's technically very demanding. You have to have barcodes, you have to have freezers and backup freezers, you have to have lots of space for it. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's not simple to do really good uh, biobanking. Uh, and, uh, and so we're doing a really good biobank in Cleveland. Okay, 
and you said soon. Soon, soon, here. yes. He's, he's actually started. We have about the first 100 people uh, in from the Cleveland site, and we haven't extended it to any other site yet because we just want to really make sure that all of the technology and the techniques uh -oh. are, are down. But we'll know soon. Yeah. There was a hand over here. Gene. Yeah. Could you touch briefly on that? Yeah. It doesn't have a connection to what you're doing in the clinical studies. Yeah, ex absolutely. So and then I'm going to I'm going to uh, stop because I've got other things, and I'm sure you do too. Um, Faster Cures is a is a an organization that uh, advances science through identifying various capital resources. So it brings venture capital uh, into contact with scientists. It brings donors into contact with sciences, scientists. It prioritizes science so that donors can see what's the most important science and where is the return on investment the highest. So it, it is a, an amazing organization which uh, brings together financing and science. And that's critically important because science is expensive. You hear the one scan, six thousand dollars. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it's, in, it's incredible. Um, and yet, it's the only way to find new treatments. And so that's why Faster Cures uh, is in the business of trying to figure out how to make the capital available to do great science. Okay, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you all. This was a really great session.